Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long-range U.S. Focus Forecast video brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided for perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that all long-range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. We begin first in the tropics because this is where a lot of the action is going to be in the next few days here. Certainly, Umberto is out to open ocean and not causing much problem. But right now, we just saw over the last 24 hours the emergence of Tropical Storm Jerry. Jerry is one we're going to have to talk quite a bit about over the coming days in our short-term forecast because the forecast track of Jerry brings it over here. And one of the tricky things about forecasting Jerry will be the passages of deeper troughs that move through the United States, potentially steering Jerry back out to ocean. And the position and strength of the subtropical ridge is it going to be placed here in the Central Pacific, or excuse me, Central Atlantic, or moving east or west with time. That's going to be the tricky part with forecasting Jerry's path. But right now, I think that probably the most important system for the United States is Imelda, which is right here. And Imelda will be moving north and slowly interacting with a frontal boundary that's going to be draped right in through this area on which we're anticipating a lot of rainfall. We're going to talk about that in a few moments. Uh, but first, you can see over on the right-hand side, wherever you see these cooler colors, this represents where the upper levels of the atmosphere uh, today, where I put the X, next week here, and then finally week two, uh, where we're anticipating having really good upper level support for the development of more tropical systems. So this is very typical this time of year, given that we're at the peak of hurricane season. But in this particular long-range forecast video, I want to tell you why I'm going to focus primarily on the central United States. In that area, we've seen here over the last 60 days some locations picking up an additional 10-plus inches of rainfall just in the last two months. We're still dealing with drought in parts of Texas, drought in the inner part here of the southeast, although along the coast and in Florida, things have been very wet. And if we come out to the Pacific Northwest, this is the time of year where we just start to pick up precipitation anyway, given that it's the start of the wet season. Uh, why I'm not focusing too much on the south or southeast is because this time of year to give you a long range forecast for that area, given tropical volatility, you know, with, with tropical systems coming through, it, it, it just won't matter. It just won't make any sense just given how um, unpredictable things will be there. So I'm going to focus in the central United States here, okay? Over the last 24 hours, this is going to be the main setup for what we're going to be discussing. Okay, so over the last 24 hours, what we saw was our first of several fronts coming through this section of the country. Imelda down here, now downgraded to a tropical depression, has already dropped along coastal parts of Texas six plus inches of rain. And as it continues to move to the north, what's going to happen is fronts from repeated low pressure systems that are following this northern U.S. track are basically going to leave the frontal boundary sitting somewhere in through this vicinity. Given that there will be higher atmospheric pressure sitting over the southeast, we're going to keep funneling that moisture into this area. And the consequence of having repeated storm systems coming into the Pacific Northwest, keeping the storm track here in the northern plains in southern Canada, means that these boundaries are not going to be able to penetrate too far to the south. You can see it best right here. Next nine days, as forecast by the National Blended Model. Again, this uses European data. This uses data from all of the models we run in the United States. And it's the same picture. Storm track coming in through like this running through the northern plains, low pressure systems following along this as they lift toward the northeast and eastern Canada. What they do though is they bring cold frontal boundaries that move like this and eventually stall in this vicinity. And with a big ridge sitting here, we're pumping moisture and right now a tropical disturbance into those boundaries. Now I hate to have to say this again, but parts of southeastern Nebraska, southern Iowa, almost all of Missouri, eastern Kansas, uh, in parts of western Illinois, especially eastern Kansas and western uh, Missouri. This area has already seen a 20 plus inch surplus on the year for rainfall. Now, when you look at this, I know you're going, wow, are we really talking six to 10 inches of rain? Locally, yes, but over this entire area, no. I often think of the blended model as kind of showing us a worst case scenario, and it's good at highlighting where to anticipate the most activity. Uh, but we see here certainly over the next eight to nine days, that is going to be the area that beginning at the end of this week really starts to light up here with a lot of rainfall. So we have to watch out for that. In the northern plains, any rainfall we're getting in this area is going to be rough just given how bad the flooding has been. Uh, where they need the rain is in parts of the southwest. They need it in the southeast. And instead, it's coming right up the gut of the United States. So all of our global long range models are in pretty good agreement here with this pattern over the next 15 days. Uh, storm track here, stalling boundaries into this area, dry over the southeast, 
This is from the first tropical system, but we're going to continue to see that area get quite wet over the coming days. One area of uncertainty to mention here uh, is part of the desert southwest. We had a underperforming monsoon this year, but I'm watching a couple of tropical systems. Some of their moisture actually may come up into the Baja and get pulled into the upper level flow and taken over Arizona, New Mexico, uh, parts of northern Mexico here, which would... Um, potentially produce a lot of flooding. We're going to watch that carefully over the coming days, but that's certainly something I want those folks watching this in the southwest to be paying attention to. So we're going to come right back to the central U.S. region. Now what is this central U.S. region? North to south, it's North Dakota all the way down to northern Texas. East to west, it's Colorado clear to Ohio. It's a huge area we're talking about here. And I'm showing you over the last 70 years what precipitation amount has looked like. So it's year on year. That's the kind of green line in the background. Now, what you're noticing is this blue line. That's the trend line. And over this time period, for the month of October, we've actually gained about a third of an inch of rainfall. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, normal October rainfall for this region averages three inches. So we're talking here about a 10% increase in overall rainfall over the last 70 years. And the trend is forecast to continue into the future, which means we're getting wetter in October, which certainly impacts harvest. So I did this to help understand what to expect this October, since we now can see with our short range models to the end of September. I found the wettest Octobers in the central region. They're listed for you right down here. Wettest to driest. So 2009 is the wettest. 1971 is the 10th uh, wettest, okay? And you know how in several of the videos recently, I've been talking so much about this Aleutian Island trough. I said that's typically where our storm pattern is setting up at the end of summer, beginning of October, such that if we see that, okay, what that tends to allow to have happen is the jet stream wants to do this. And that highly amplified pattern, and that's a key thing, highly amplified pattern, tends to produce a deep trough over the desert southwest and a big ridge that runs up the east coast. When that happens, right in the middle here, we tend to have very volatile weather, lots of low pressure systems. So the first question is, are we anticipating that? Well, we can at least look out to the end of September by watching the animation over there on the left. What I do see here is an unblocked pattern. We see troughs and ridges moving quite easily. And as I get out to the beginning of October, which again is our forecast time period here, October, I don't see what I would need to see to call October wet. Why? We have a ridge in this area. See it? We have a trough that's kind of extending here along the west coast, which is why I do believe that the west coast and parts of the northern plains, this area I just circled, does have a better chance of being wetter than drier. But across, well, let's just call it this corridor, which in 2018 was the wettest, one of the wettest on record. Okay, one, it was our wettest harvest on record. But October 2018, very, very wet in there. Well, we don't see the right configuration to make a repeat of last year. Even as I get out to mid-month, let's now switch over to the ECMWF here. I'm showing you kind of a, a composite of its trough ridge system. We see ridging here off the Gulf of Alaska, excuse me, off of the Aleutian Islands. We see ridging over the southwest, ridging off the southeast, and a ridge over Greenland. That's at least the forecast track with lows kind of tucked away in this area. Now, this could set up for a very volatile uh, early part of October for Europe, but in terms of this showing me a relatively flat flow, it's the wrong configuration to make October sit in one of those wettest months on, on, on our record, okay? Keeping moving with this discussion, take a look at this. Ocean temperatures in our wettest Octobers tend to favor La Nina-like behavior here and the negative phase of something called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. That's where there's cool water tucked into uh, the Gulf of Alaska. Well, this is what we've got right now. Instead of having the negative phase of the PDO, we have the positive phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And the emergence of this cool water, which we've been watching since July, well, it's happening on these very short-term easterly wind bursts. And that is indicative of La Nina. But right now, take a look at what's going on. The Southern Oscillation Index, well, this is the zero line. The Southern Oscillation Index since uh, late August has been going back negative. And negative Southern Oscillation Index is indicative of El Nino. And positive SOI is more like La Nina. If we were seeing La Nina-like conditions, the forecast on this Hofmuller diagram would be very blue in this area. And if it were blue in there, I would see stronger trade winds. And I would say, yep, we're going into a La Nina fall. But instead, the Pacific Ocean wind anomalies are not that anomalous, and the pressure patterns are more suggestive of weak El Nino than they are of anything else. So that's out of a configuration for having a very wet 
for having a very wet um, October. Finally, just one last thing to look at here before we see our global models. We look deep in the atmosphere. I would want to see if we were going to have a very wet October. Uh, negative velocity potentials here, here, and extending into the central United States. Now, what is a negative velocity potential? This is looking at how easy it is to get air to exhaust into the upper levels of the atmosphere. If it's easy, that means we could get lots and lots of thunderstorm activity. It would be wet in all the areas that are blue. Let me show you. For those same years, look at how wet things were here, here, and there. What do we have right now? Well, this is from the National Multimodel Ensemble forecasting for October. That model's picking up on the effect of the Mad Julian Oscillation, the Indian Ocean Dipole, El Nino, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Everything is working together to make this air. I put a D over it for dry. And that is not in the best configuration for making the middle part of the United States wet. It tends to keep the northwest wet. It tends to keep the southeast wet. But right here in the middle, this area showing up dry. So we see these pieces kind of not lining up to make October a super wet month for the mid part of the United States. So now what we can do is we can turn our attention away from the analog forecast I just gave you now to a kind of a summary of our long range global models. Now, when we think about this, please don't forget the statement I wrote up here in the upper left. There are some places in the central United States that any rain right now is going to be bad just because they're flood prone. But where we see things looking wetter are in this corridor here, this stretches along the west coast of North America, and also down here in the southeast. A lot of this may be driven more by tropical cyclone activity. Right in through here, long range models. I'm including the ECMWF, I'm including all the models in the National Multimodel Ensemble, I'm also including CANSIPS, which is a model out of Canada. They're painting that particular corridor on the drier side of things. Where the models are in disagreement is primarily here in the north central plains, Minnesota and Wisconsin. And what's going on here is that this particular area is, well, showing a lot of volatility model to model run. And as a consequence, that's an area I don't have a good understanding of at this point moving forward, because I still do see the northern U.S. storm track taking over throughout the end of September and into the month of October, which may mean that area stays wet. And that is a disastrously bad forecast if it is going to continue to stay wet in that area. But unlike a year ago, where this whole corridor was wet, I am not seeing that for 2019 in October. That's the main statement I'm trying to make here at the beginning of this video. Let's turn our attention now to temperatures. In the United States, kind of the first place not in the mountains to start off with some sub-freezing temperatures is way up here in Maine. We saw sub-freezing temperatures early this morning on Wednesday. As I animate this forward, you'll see it again on Thursday morning. They got up there to sub-freezing uh, as well tomorrow. Meanwhile, the midsection of the country, well, let me just show you what the temperatures are going to look like here. Midsection of the country, much above average temperatures. We see cooler weather snaking down here from the north east into, well, through parts of Virginia and the Carolinas. There's a little backdoor cold front sneaking through there as we see heat just staying in the midsection of the United States, much above average temperatures in the coming days here. And as I take this out to Saturday, Sunday, Monday, even though we do have a system moving through the northern plains that could cool things off a little bit, what you don't see in my forecast here from the National Digital Forecast Database is uh, any sub-freezing temperatures where we're growing corn and soybeans in the midsection of the United States. Now I want to show you this animation because I've seen on Ag Talk, I've seen this, this has been sent to me on Twitter, I've had great questions from some folks I work with, they're saying, man, we keep seeing the models thrown in really cold waves like that one right there. You see that? You're looking here at a forecast for October 1st. But in this animation, this isn't moving forward in time. What I'm showing you here are several different model forecasts for the exact same time. We're looking at something called DPROG, DT, DPROGNOSIS, which means the change in prognosis over time. Every map here is forecast for October 1st, Tuesday. And what we see here is that it's highly volatile. That's why I don't ever show you these things. And instead, I show you ensemble forecasts where we blend together several different model runs and from several different models. And this is a much steadier approach than by looking at individual model runs. So what do we see? Well, over the next five days, there is a trough that's developing out in the western United States and a large ridge here. And Imelda is sliding in underneath that ridge while we're waiting for this trough to eject into the central plains. But even out through day six through 10, 
Thinking about frost here, this is not the kind of pattern we would want to see if a frost were coming in. In fact, you see stretching through the midsection of the country above average temperatures over that time period. Even looking out farther than that, we get out here to days 11 through 15. Remember, this is where we started to see the flow pattern doing something a bit more like that. Jet stream staying north, and therefore this region still forecasts to see above average temperatures as we finish the month of September and get into the month of October. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, uh, volatility beyond 10 days is always high. And uh, when we look at this, we must understand that the ensemble approach to forecasting tends to flatten features out. But this is not the kind of well, long range forecast that I would expect to see if we were going to be getting an early frost at the end of this year, or excuse me, at the end of this growing season. Remember, we're also at that time period where it's normal to get that to happen. So yesterday I worked on a new product for you. And what we're going to watch here is the probability of having a frost. Now, when you look at this, what I'm using here is the GFS Ensemble. It has 21 separate runs in it. So I'm going to overlay where there's above freezing and below freezing air. And I'm going to shade in the below freezing air. So as I animate this forward, this is taking you out. This is every uh, six hours here. We're going to go all the way out until the 4th of October. Now you're going, wait a minute, I start to see, look, see, some of them are overlapping here in this region. And the answer that I have for you, if, if you're questioning this, is, well, this is what we would expect this time of year. I mean, to get an, an October frost in North Dakota, northern Minnesota, that would be late. And at this point, I only have maybe one or two different ensemble members trying to bring in that colder air into this area. So when you look at this, wherever you see the darkest colors, that's the highest probability of having a frost. And what I'm trying to say is, even stretching out to the beginning of October, which we just saw, the probability of a big you know, invading frost in here is very low at this point. And I'm not seeing it just yet. In fact, if we even look out farther in October, things actually look to be on the warmer side of things. So... Remember this, the pattern always looks smooth when we look at these long range model updates, but I'm gonna bring you back to what I showed you here. This is not the configuration of the jet stream by mid-October to be bringing in, you know, a big frost that would hit a big part of the crop. Uh, the pattern is relatively flat. It's staying much farther to the north. And if we see troughing over Alaska, that tends to ease things across the United States in terms of our flow pattern of the atmosphere and our risk of frost. So what do we know? Pacific, North Pacific is warm. Central Pacific is cool, but we're not seeing La Nina-like weather. Number two, remember we're approaching normal first frost dates over the next 15 to 30 days. So at this point, we've kind of gotten out of the scare of that super early September frost. And as you just saw, we got some heat coming in in the next 10 days that are really gonna remove that, that fear, all right? What to watch out for? Well, if the European model and other models are wrong, We'll see the opposite of this. I'll not only get a big ridge here, but another big ridge here and a, and a deep low that forms out in this area. So I'm talking way out over here. And if that happens, that allows for a lot of cold air to spill into this part of the country. But we're not seeing that in the forecast models right now. But our first frost will likely come in on a situation like this. So this is what we have to watch out for in forecast. Watch for a big low pressure system to run across the central United States. I expect it to dig, which means it's going to move southeast rather than northeast. And I expect high pressure to move in behind it. And high pressure sets us up with a clear, calm night. And that's when we'll get dinged with the frost. But right now, I just don't see it. Now, I want to give you a little bit of a teaser on what I'm going to talk about next week. You know that we've been discussing how dry things have been in this section of Brazil uh, over the last several months, and they have some serious drought to overcome here. In the next 10 to 15 days, because that Manjulian isolation is going to be hanging out in phases 8, 1, and 2, that's favorable for a stronger low-level jet in through this area and potentially increasing precipitation right in through here. They need more of this to get this crop planted, so this isn't going to really spur on a lot of early planting of soybeans. But we're going to be talking about what happens to get the South American Convergence Zone to really get going and get wet, what controls the Brazilian monsoon. So we're going to be speaking about something called the Intertropical Convergence Zone. We'll talk about the Manjulian Oscillation. We're going to talk about the flow pattern that really would bring precipitation up in this area. So that's going to be my focus next week. But with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this forecast video. We new to your next solutions. Thank you for your attention. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.